Thank you. Um, I, I, I've got two, there's two key features in this title. One of is the important things, which we'll come on to at the end. And the other one is the Belfort Brown Club. The Belfort Brown Club, we, we have, we're some international study group. And I, want, I was hoping that we, I'd point, that's some sort of point of the future for uh, the Bowen in that we need to look much more widely at why these species are where they are within the island and elsewhere, and why perhaps some of them are absent from GB and so on. Uh, so I think that, that hasn't been covered so far, so at least I can contribute something new. Next slide, please. Yeah, well, um, I have a I have a love-hate relationship with a certain Mr. Michael O'Leary, and um, one of the reasons that one of the reasons for the love is that uh, in the good old days, uh, ten years ago, whatever it was, um, I was able to be in my bed in air, that's A Y R, not E I R E, in, in, in Scotland, and uh, be in Presswick Airport an hour later, and then with a bit of luck, be in either the Bowen or in a traffic jam in Ennis or something like that. In, in, in the afternoon. In other words, I could go beetling in the afternoon in Ireland, courtesy of Mr. O'Leary and, and a flight to the Shannon Shannon Airport. Um, so so I, I've got lots of things to be thankful to him for. But um, we'd better cover the um, next slide, please. Is, is, uh, I should acknowledge that there's also a hate relationship in that uh, last month he dumped me in Palermo in, in Sicily without any flight or any means of support whatsoever. And I had to spend the better part of 2,000 euros um, getting to Naples and then flying, not, not dying in Naples, but flying from Naples to Edinburgh and with my family. And as a result of which, I got COVID. And so, as Brian has been warned, if, if, if my cough starts to get bad, Brian's going to have to take over. So he can, he can blame Michael O'Leary for if he has to take over, OK? Uh, so thank you also to Anya for inviting me to come to this meeting. Uh, thanks to the various anonymous photographics of sources I've probably nicked. Uh, Anders Nilsson, as you'll see later on, is a very important part of the scene. Adrian Velastrigo is the man, is, is the man for DNA. If you want uh, some of their contacts abroad, he's now in Munich. I uh, used to be in Bar Barcelona, and he was very helpful to me in, in interpreting the the work of the late Ignacio Ribera, who did most of the um, uh, DNA work until COVID swept him away. So, next slide, please. Uh, if you look at the Irish Red Data Book and you go through, go through it and whip, whip out the species that are centred on the bone, you come to about 10 species and they've got these wonderful names that Brian, uh, with, I suppose in, in collusion with me, uh, came up with for these things. Uh, some of which are good, some of which are not, not quite so helpful. I'll, I'll, I'm going to try and stick to the Latin names if I can. Uh, well, one thing that worried me about the last speaker was that he's, he mentioned Bagris lutosis, but we'll come back to that later. That, that's the miry sloth weaver at the bottom. I thought, I just, there's a horrible thing with Bagris that they, they, they're some, some idiot called them lutosis, lutulensis, and lutulosis, which is bound to cause confusion in the, in the long run. Anyway, back next slide, please. Next, that's it. So on the, on the top left, you've got uh, the lipped diver, Agabus labiatus, which is a, a diving beetle. And it is, uh, it's, it's important in the barn because um, it's, it's, the adult is quite short-lived. The larvae uh, live in open water, quite unlike most Agabus larvae, uh, where they prey on Codosera. And uh, in the, if, it's found in two quite distinct habitats in Britain. One is which is very, very acid water, and the other one is, is, is habitats that dry out completely. And of course, the key to both of those is fish. Fish. Uh, uh, if the habitat dries out, then the, the, the beetle can survive. If it's very acid, the fish can't survive either. So that, that's, that's a very important attribute for that species that doesn't actually cover the next one along, which is another, another diving beetle, uh, Graptodites bilineatus, which weirdly lives along the, uh, coast, the coastal strip, south coast of England and in, in some Welsh islands in Wales and also in Jersey, and, and then, then jumps across to the, to the Bowen. Uh, next to those, you've got two uh, Barossa species. Uh, they are hydrophilids. Most hydrophilids are uh, vegetation feeders of some, of some sort or another. Some, sometimes called scavenger beetles, which is probably a misnomer. But these particular ones are predators and are active swimmers as well. And they're both uh, confined, not uh, both limited to the barren. In Barossa signaticollis, my colleague, uh, Professor David Bilton, I think he was the first to find it in Ireland in 1986. 
uh, when he recognised it was very important as part of the sort of moss edge dwelling community in the, in the Turlocks. But against that, you've got the one on the right is a lot of strigophons, which you wouldn't find that sort of habitat. You find that in, in shaded sedge litter. And then down the left, we have Triops similaris. Um, uh, the best anecdote about that is that there's a place in East Anglia where you can find it as an interglacial fossil in a quarry. In other words, uh, and also as the way it actually is happily living now as a pioneer species. In other words, it lives in exposed uh, calcareous habitats, um, regardless of whether they're ancient or, or modern. The next one along is Octhebius exculptus, which in Britain is found, and in the rest of Europe, is found in uh, calcareous rivers, that in Ireland chooses to be in a few lakes. Um, can you just just uh, press the button again, please. Just one more time, just not, not gently, gently. Press the, that's it, thank you. And there we have, out completely out of scale because it's only about 1.5 millimeters long. We have the, the Octhebius nilsoni, which uh, Brian has already mentioned. Uh, but it's, uh, that's, that's one of the smallest species on that, on that on this list. And then you've got two uh, sloth weevils, as, as Brian has called, called their name for, very nice. They are, they are very slothful. They, they, they're very, 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 very difficult to find because they're so inert, or that they can gallop away when they think you're not looking. Uh, and they, they are associated with particular plants. And uh, yeah, next slide. Yeah. And now, if you try to sort of do one-liners to explain these, these species, as you, uh, then and if, you, if you scan down that, you'll see that there's some, some of the things are repeated and some things are not. So, yes, but Agabus labiatus is particularly in impermanent sites, or perhaps at the acid sites, and therefore found in relic sites. Uh, Bilineatus found in non-brackish, but always coastal sites. Verosus in peaty sites, but they're also base rich. Uh, Signatic collis in exposed sites, strigophons sometimes in shaded sedge litter, Octhebius sculptus in, in uh, pristine running water with lime rich. Nilsson and I will come to uh, with the Costa and the Stein and so on. The uh, similarities, as I say, could be a pioneer species in quarries in East Anglia, but it could also be interglacially in, in, in exposed lakes. Uh, and you've got Bagra, the two Bagras there, one of which lives on lesser spearwork and is arguably relics, and the other one, Bagras lutosus lives on Potomogeton in, in the Baron. Okay, but this is, this is in no way a community. It's just a cluster of species that happen to be uh, come together at the Baron. Quite rare to find one site that has more than uh, three of these species at any one time. So none of these species is exactly confined, ex exclusively confined to the Baron, but they're certainly found on limestone rich areas in Ireland. Next slide, please. I keep pressing my, I keep pressing my mouse, I'm, mouse, I'm so used to using my mouse, I'll, I'll throw the mouse away. There we are. Right, so what brings these things together is you can actually draw some sort of thing that, brings, that make, make, as it produces a commonality. First of all, they're lowland, uh, they're mainly coastal, but they're not brackish water species. Um, they're often found on exposed mineral shorelines, uh, sometimes into deep water with wave action, with good oxygen. And they're generally shade intolerant species, uh, apart from one or two I mentioned, the Pilophus the, the frigophons particularly. Um, they're in base rich sites, but, but that doesn't necessarily mean that they're vegetation rich sites. These are oligotrophic sites, they have low phosphate levels, that restricts the plant growth and makes sure that there re really is plenty of exposure for any insects that want to live, say, deep in the water. They're, they're not going to be shaded out. Um, the sites typically uh, need probably to dry out in midsummer. Some they can dry out for several years on end if you like. And they tend to be, need to be fish free, and they can be anything though from undisturbed history right the way through to modern man-made quarries. Next slide, please. I'm still trying to press my non-existent mouse. <laughs> um, Octavius Nilsson. Yeah, the um, Octavius is, is the weirdest thing. I, I, I you, you not. I think I. This is probably the best one so far of all the invertebrates we mentioned. It's confined at the moment to Sweden, Italy and Ireland. It's the most extreme example of a disjunct distribution in water beetles and presumably of lots of other insects as well. Uh, the DNA shows that there's a 14,000 year gap between the Swedish uh, population and the Italian population. Uh, but the Swedish and the, Italian and the Irish populations were about the same in age, about a thousand years at most to separate them. So a big gap. Uh, associated with the Alps, so south of the Alps and north of the Alps. Um, it's associated with karstic areas, 
uh, mainly in, in this Krustenstein, which is this, um, uh, this gloop of um, blue-green algae and algae and slime that you find on exposed surfaces in, 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 in phosphate pool water, sometimes in deep water, and its, guts, uh, its gut is full of this uh, algae, as, as with most Octavia species, they are mainly algivorous. It can be very abundant, uh, it can be infuriatingly elusive and absent, and it's small enough to be overlooked. Um, we think this is the most, one of the most important species in Ireland. Uh, I'll, give you another, I'll give you another example, and, uh, which is Octhebius lenensis. This is not on your sheet anywhere. I always used to think Octhebius lenensis was named after Lenin because it was um, found only in the Murray Firth area of Scotland and in eastern Siberia, which is another extreme example. There is actually now more or less a link between uh, the, the north of Scotland and, and the extreme east of Russia. Um, but that species, I distinctly remember a member of a, a, of a conservation body, um, paid by the government, uh, when I showed him Octavius lenensis in, in a live, it's 1.5 millimetres long, he laughed. He didn't, he didn't think, he thought it was stupid. He, didn't, he couldn't understand why anybody should want to conserve an Octavius, which I found extremely, and still find, extremely worrying about somebody working for the... Uh, the Scottish Conservation Body. Next slide, please. Um, this is this is where Octavius Nilsson was first found. I'm not going to pronounce this one. I might try some of the others later on. It's uh, a, a lake in in the north of Sweden. Uh, it separates. It's got it's running straight through the middle of it, a railway line, which is a uh, which is interesting. Uh, it's, it's hard bottomed. I wouldn't say it was calcareous, but it's certainly hard bottomed uh, with very little vegetation. So that that's the characteristic that you've got. Uh, exposed uh, surfaces deep into the water. Uh, it's the only place it's found, and that's, that's not for the want of looking in a large, numbers of area, a large number of ponds in that area. The only suspicious thing about this is actually it's right next door to where the president of our Balfour Brown Club lives. Um, so, <laughs> uh, yeah, you can, you can draw con what conclusions you like about that. But basically, this, this is where uh, Anders Nelson lives, and he, he's, he can only find it there, and he has looked elsewhere, I'm sure, and other people looked elsewhere. But that's the first place. It's found in 1986, I think, I can't, I've, I've, got my, my, I've got a picture of me, so I can't see the rest of my screen. Next slide, please. Anyway, it was discovered in Loch Machine in, in Ogalway in 2006 by Owen Callahan, and um, <clears throat> for my sins, I originally identified it as a, a species that would have been new to Ireland. Uh, well, there's one dodgy old record, Octhebius nanus. Um, and uh, it was only because Manfred Yak in the Vienna Museum suggested it that I actually checked against Nilsson I from um, Sweden and found that it was the same thing. It was quite a shock but to, to discover that we had uh, this species from Sweden found in Ireland but not found anywhere in Britain. And then <clears throat> the same year, although we didn't know anything about it at the time, um, Manfred Carla had, had found it in the Taliamento Valley in Italy. In two, and, uh, and later on, uh, it was only as a result of this talk that I discovered that there is an old record that people were, I don't know if they were keeping quiet about it, or they simply forgot to tell us, but there was an old record for Lake Garda in Italy as well. So if, if, if somebody in Ireland can come up with some nice money for a holiday for, for their staff, they could send them to Lake Garda. We've got a good place to get to start on it, looking for this species. Next slide, please. Next. Hello, yeah. This is, oh no, not that one. No, go back one, that one, that one. Thank you. That, this is the Taliamento Valley. Um, it's a bit out of focus, but it's, it's, a, it's a nice shot because it's, it's taken by the man who found the Octavius Nilsson in the first place. And I don't know if, if I don't think my, my, my thing won't work. I can't use a pointer here, can I? But you see there's a little sort of, uh, the, the two bits of an island there, which is stretching towards the mainland on the left. That, that's also a railway line. And you can get, you can, you can walk along that railway line and fall off it and find nice places for, for this extraordinary habitat. This is all thick, creamy marl. If you get into the wrong place, it's extremely dangerous because it's a, it's just like walking in potty filler, if you know that stuff. Next slide, please. And the, the, some of the better characteristics that sites are here uh, with the white uh, sediments. And uh, I have been there three times and I have not found Octhebius nilsonii yet. Well, I did find another species new for Italy. Uh, but uh, so there's, there's still a chance to actually go and find some more specimens in this area, as I say, including Lake Garda in Italy. 
Next slide. And then, of course, we have it in the Narchmoor, and uh, it's in in five lochs in the in the, um, the Bowen, uh, plus Loch Carra, uh, out, out lying out with the Bowen. Uh, and yeah, just go to the next slide. We have oh oh sorry yes I must introduce you to people. There's Steve, Stephen McCormack on the left, um, still is in Cambridge I think now. Uh, John Cuppen, a uh, prominent um, coleopterist uh, from the Netherlands, and their most important of the lot there is Anders Nilsson. Uh, actually, we, we took him, I drove him from um, Larne to uh, the, the, the Bowen to see his own species named after him, and we were very lucky we found it in huge numbers because the, the uh, that the Loch and the Loch Oler was virtually dried out. There's just a few pebbles left, absolutely teeming in it. Uh, so there we are. That, that's him. The British beetle next. And there, the Loch Loch Gale, obviously by Malik Moore. Kalota, a beautiful place, uh, deep water, and you can find it. It's this thing at anything up to wade a depth of, of water there. The Loch and Row, of course, when it's got any water in it, is, is, is good for it. Loch Bunny, we found it in huge numbers, and then other times we've not found any at all. And then, of course, the original site on the bottom right is uh, Loch Bashin. I think that's Stuart Reynolds. Uh, yes, that's Stuart Reynolds, that's Stuart Reynolds uh, bending down. Uh, David Bilson, and then with his back to the camera is, I think that's Owen Callum. But that's, it's a slightly different sort of loch. It's quite peaty with, with cladium. And I have great hopes, uh, presumably, for the locks that was talked about by the, the neck, uh, by Mantel. They, 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 they are, it should, be, it should be plenty of other locks, but these are the only ones I know about, apart from the Loch Carra site. Next site, please. Next, there you go. This crossed in the sign business, okay, a blue-green alga called Scheiser Thrix fasciculator. Um, seems to be important as, as, as it first part of the economy of the beetle. Uh, and the biofilmers in general uh, need, need, need more work done on them as, 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 as habitats and food sources for the smaller water beetles. Uh, okay, Brian is going to pronounce this name bottom right. Brian? Yeah. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you. All right, next yeah. slide. Yeah, what, 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 what's, what, what's, the, what's it mean? It means little beetle, doesn't it? I, I, I mean, uh, little white beetle. Little white beetle. There you go. Lovely. Okay, right. There we go. That, that's the name for it. We've got this, this I think it's one of our only, name, only beetles actually named in the Gallic. Um, anyway, we're similar places, and the, the first thing, I, the first place I immediately thought of when we, we found this was the, the limestone pavement fens in Anglesey. Uh, I'm pretty certain it's not there. We have a we have a water beetle residence on Anglesey who's, who's not found it. He's found plenty of other good things. Uh, the next place I would think about and checked out thoroughly uh, is uh, an island in the Hebrides called Lismore, which is almost entirely limestone. It's, a, it's its own beautiful um, calcareous. Loch Fauna, uh, but it doesn't actually include um, uh, the, this one. It includes, for those who are the cognoscenti amongst you, it includes Do Donacia aquatica uh, and uh, Riolus uh, cupreus, but certainly, certainly not this species. Uh, there are, of course, all the, all the pulsar or pingo fens dotted across Bre the brecks running into the broadland in, 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 in the east of England. Again, massive amounts of work has been done on those. Uh, plenty of them have exposed oligotrophic um, surfaces, which the species does not occur on. Uh, we've had club meetings <coughs> to check out the Alvar, which is a huge area of cast on, on the island of Öland in Sweden, uh, without success. Plenty of other things there, of course, uh, but not but not this species. Um, you may have seen in the news a few weeks ago, big fires raging in France, in, in uh, south of Bordeaux. And that, 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 that was in the area where, where we've got lots of pingo fens in Lelande. Uh, the pingo is associated with periglacy activity from the, from the Pyrenees. And it's not there either. It would be, be great if it was. And then, of course, we have the Talimento Valley, which um, we, we, we did know as a good water beetle site anyway. And on top of that, we have the Slovenian turlochs, which are, again have been checked. They again have their own fauna, but they do not have this species. And they're actually, for what it matters, there's a few turlock like uh, sites in Wales, in other parts of Wales, part of Anglesey, but it's not there either. So only the Taliamento Valley at the moment of all these sites has got, has got this species. Next slide, please. So, um, 
uh, I gave a talk, the last talk again in Ireland, I think it was in 2013 in Dublin, and I, I wanted to reveal my state of ignorance, so I, I, I started an Englishman, G.K. Chesterton, who said a beetle may or may not be inferior to a man, the matter of its demonstration, but if you're inferior to a man by 10,000 fathoms, the fact remains that there's probably a beetle of view of things of which a man is entirely ignorant, okay? Which I think that admirably sums up the situation we've got with most of our beetles. But the next slide is also more telling, and that's, uh, I thought about a uh, quote uh, an Irish lady. Uh, uh, she's, I think, from, is it Waterf Waterf no, Waterford? Yeah, I think she's Waterford. And she now lives, as far as I know, in Sydney. Her first work was called The Important Things. And within it, we have um, a quotation here from, from a thing called One Beetle, Two Beetles. Now, I'm going to try Hang on. Try this. Where are we? Yes. Anion Kiro Kiro Gaya. Is that it? Anion Kiro Kiro Gaya? That'd do. It loses something in the translation, but it means one beetle recognizes another beetle, which is more or less what G.K. Chesterton said. Uh, a hundred years later, later a late earlier, but uh, where he was, of course, talking about the fact that human beings were useless at recognizing things, whereas beetles recognize each other. So maybe one beetle, two beetles, that's my best shot at it. That's a, this is a direct quotation of Audrey Malloy. And uh, also she says, well, that's enough about beetles. Thank you, Garth. That came across absolutely perfectly. Thanks very much. Yeah. Now, did, you, did you like my pronunciations? I thought they were great, yeah. I, I thought your pronunciation was absolutely perfect because, um, yeah, it was certainly better than any of mine. Um, yeah, yeah, so that was, a, that was a talk about one of the most extraordinary species that we find in the burn. I think what Garth maybe... I, I, I would have said that what, what is different about the other sites is the lack of the Cruston sign, but Cruston sign is another story. Um, any questions for Garth? Any online? Do you want to get to say the Irish words again? <laughs> what, what, what's, what's the Irish for lunch? But I mean, uh, yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> oh, we, we, we've one more talk before lunch. Oh, well, come on, well, come on, everyone. What's the what's the, what's the what's the what's the Irish for DNA? Because it's about time that you got uh, the, all these other things properly checked out. <laughs> Anybody want to answer that? D DNA, DNA, I think you know, as in English, it's just DNA. Yeah. Yeah. It shut them up, didn't it? Mm. <laughs> 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 I, 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 will, I will, however, have to say that you did give me credit for some of those English names, which I, I do remember we did, we did spend a very strange car journey coming up with lots of penguin-themed beetle names. <laughs> but I, I, I'm not sure I actually ever, ever did sloth, sloth weevil. But... The, the, well, some, of, some of Garth, if you read the red list, you've got some wonderful English names for some of the water beetles that, strangely, never really caught on. <laughs> <laughs> well, you have to tell me, uh, well, he's turned me off. The best one, as you remember, is the, chummy, the chummier Australian. Do you remember that one? <laughs> yes, I do remember that one. Yeah, 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 yeah. I, 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 I'm very, very proud of that. It's the chummier Australian. It's, it's an anagram of King Arthur and Semi Newham. And I'm just stepping in. I actually have a question, but I'm not going to ask it. But no, 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 because I know the three of us will just keep talking about water beetles all day. Okay. <laughs> Go uh, away, Garth. <laughs> yeah, and, and the wonderful thing from Garth's talk is that the burn is not just dry habitats. There are an awful lot, and, and, and Adam's, Adam's talk also emphasised that we have a very important wetland habitats. Okay, thanks very much, Garth. Uh, we're